Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We brought in the camera. I can't see anything today, so I'm not sure how it's working. So we're going by a chance. <laughs> <laughs> The Lord has been putting a line of a verse in my heart. Just a line. The line you're very familiar with, you'll find it in Psalm 95, verse 10. I'm going to read the entire verse here so that you can understand that. Psalm 95, verse 10. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is the people that go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. Now as it was being reminded to me, it was always, and the people do err in their hearts. But today that's what I want to look at. I want to examine this line of scripture. What did God mean that the people erred in their hearts because they did not know his ways? And the one thing that was coming very, very strongly across to me every time this line was reminded to me was that we are living in the last era of the church age. We are living in the last times, just prior to Jesus Christ's return. And there's a warning, a warning recorded in Scripture to this generation. I want to go quickly to that so that we understand where we're going from here. Go to Revelations. He says, knowing that he marked it earlier and no driver that he's lost the marking. Go to Revelation 3. It's verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write. These things said the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, and that you are neither cold or hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I won't stop there, at that particular place at the moment, because Paul tells us, as we go through his letters, that many of the things that happened to the Israelites in the past were for our teaching here in the present and for the future. They are to warn us about things that happened before so that we can see similarities and patterns and be aware of them. So when this line kept reverberating for the last two weeks in my mind, I thought I'd better go and look it up and see exactly where it all happened. So go to Numbers, please. So we find out exactly what was going on here. You'll find it in Numbers 14. Numbers 14. And we know the story because the story relates back to the spies who were sent out by Moses to explore the promised land. They had just come through the desert. It was the beginning of the 40 year period. In fact, the 40 years hadn't started yet. And they had the opportunity to go straight into the land and possess it. So they sent spies out so they could get a good report back. And all the spies went out and they saw a beautiful land. A land that stretched out before them. And they brought back the products of the land so that everyone could see that this was indeed a rich, bountiful land full of milk and honey. But there was a weak problem. Just a, just a smidge of a problem. Just a little thing that sort of irritated ten of the spies that went out. And that was, there were men in that place that were seven and eight foot tall. Seven and eight foot tall. Giants of men! And they said, what are we compared to these men? We're just like grasshoppers. We could never take this land. Now, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, were 600,000 strong. That was only the men, 600,000 men, besides women and children. 
600,000. This was a massive army. This was an army designed to be able to just walk in and take possession of a land. But they were looking and they were judging by their sight. Well, let's face it, would we not have done the same thing? Would we not have looked at obstacles? Would we not have concerned ourselves about how difficult things were going to be? Of course we would. So we can relate very simply to how these people saw this. But there was two spies who had a different approach. Their name was Joshua and Caleb. Their report was, we won't have a problem taking the land. I know there's giants. I know all about that. But we've got what they don't have. We have got a God who has given us the land. Their protection is gone. It's fled. As soon as we entered that land and looked around us, their protection was hanging it over the hills and far away. They have nobody to look after them. And so all we have to do is walk in and take the land. But there was only two voices saying this. Only two. And the people listened. And the people consisted of all the leaders. 600,000 men, then women, then children. And they were listening. And all the leaders decided, oh, we've got to consider the women and children. Think of what it would be like us having come from Egypt, getting to the promised land, only to be massacred by all these giants. We'd become worse slaves than we were before. Ah, this is a bad, 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 terrible thing. Oh, what are we doing? And so they were. And they started to grumble and complain, and then they turned on Moses and Aaron. God at this point decides he's had enough. He says, nice and simply, and I'll find it here if I can just find it right, that he would not allow these people to no. enter into the land. And as a result, for every day that they have been exploring the land, 40 days, he was going to have them remain out of the land a day per year principle. So their disobedience has resulted in them no longer being allowed to go into the land. But God reminds them quite quickly that their carcasses, their bodies will fall in the wilderness outside of the land. And until the last one of them dies, he is not going to permit the people to go into the land, to inherit the promise that he had wanted to give them. And he had brought them here directly, as a gift to them, but because of their attitudes. But he says something very interesting. He didn't say this was the first time they'd ever rejected him. He actually says they rejected him ten times since he has started calling them out of Egypt. They have rejected him ten times and questioned his ability. So, maybe we need to give a wee bit of consideration to that. We need to understand these people. We need to see what would make a people reject their God when he was so direct in working with them. See, God wasn't doing this on the sly. It wasn't like they had to accept by faith. They saw the pillar of fire by night and the cloud of smoke by day, the pillar of smoke by day. They saw that. It continually went before them. They heard the voice of God. They saw the smoke come down on the mountain. They experienced being allowed to not be touched by the plagues that fell in Egypt. And they all passed through the Red Sea, with the water mounting up on each side of them, so far up over them that they could hardly believe their eyes. And yet, they walked in dry land through. So, God had used many, 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 mighty miracles with these people, so that they would get to know that he was capable of doing anything. But yet, it was a problem for them. So let's understand it from their perspective. Let's go back and examine it. Go to Exodus. Now, in, I'm saying go to Exodus, but let's go there in a minute. Let's go first to Genesis 14. 
Active Genesis 50. This is the account after Abraham has met Matislebeth. God has made a promise to Abraham that his descendants will come from the son of promise. And he has, he has also said to him, your descendants will multiply as the stars of heaven, as the sands of the sea. But then he shows him a vision. And it's in this chapter 15 that we begin to see the vision. And in verse 13 he says, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. And also in the nation from whom they serve, I will judge afterwards, and they will come out with great possessions. And then verse 16. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquities of the Ammonites is not yet complete. Now, that threw me a little bit off for a moment. That says, hang on a minute. Well, stop. How could there only be four generations from Moses to Abraham? It doesn't work. And then I realized I misunderstood. I misunderstood this. It wasn't four generations from Abraham to Moses. It's four generations from Abraham to Joseph. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. God's talking about when this would begin. When to start counting your 400 years. So that you understand it's only when they go into Egypt that the process begins. And they go into Egypt because of famine in the land where they're in. So we know that the people are aware of why they're in Egypt. They know why they have got and to live in Goshen. They understand that. It's because their father Abraham met the living God who appeared to his father, or his son, who appeared to his son, their fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And the same God had promised them a new land. But they were in Egypt just for a period of time. No more than 400 years. That's what basically they were of the mindset. Because this is what they've been taught. Now if we go to Exodus. Just uh, we jump over to Exodus. Easy chapter. Chapter 1. Starting in verse 6. And Joseph died. All his brothers and all that generation. So everybody from that first generation has died. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. And we can appreciate that because there's 600,000 of them about to leave the land before 400 years time. And all the people of the land saw that the Israelites were blessed. Things went well with them. They prospered. They didn't have difficulties. With regard to having children, they seem to breed without any difficulties. In fact, later on we are told that the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives have come. You'll find that same chapter, but on verse 19. But why was that necessary to know? Well, it's because a king a king, a pharaoh who did not know Joseph came to power now the interesting thing about this king was he started the oppression he started the difficulties so this is what I want you to consider we have a people that have been in a land for approximately 350 to 340 to 350 years approximately they're about to be moved out of the land at 430 years after being there. Now that's counted from when Joseph was taken. That's what it's counted from. But what I need you to understand, what is important to grasp, is that while we, when we read through this, think that they have been afflicted and persecuted and hated for all that time, that's not what the Bible teaches. These people have been blessed. 
They have been prospering. They have enjoyed the highest standard of living known in their day. They were in the most advanced society of their day. They had the best of everything until oppression starts with this pharaoh. And he determined this people, let's read what he says, verse 9, and he said to, this, to his people, look, the people of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Can you imagine being a king of a country and suddenly realizing that you have a people living among you who aren't subject to you, who have been given permission within the laws of the land to live separately from you because of the need to worship their God. They are not subject to the gods or idols of your country. They don't even need to pay you tax. And they're living happily among you. And what's worse? They're more numerous than you are. So he says, these people are more mighty and more than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happens that in the event of war they join with their enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. So they recognize the problem. They're recognizing that this is a threat. We need to do something about this. Therefore, this king, this pharaoh, ordered a building program. Some of the biggest and most advanced cities of their day that was dotted on in Egypt were done at this period of time. And he enforced labor. Now, again, we, because of our era, we think of slavery by the variations of what it was like in America. If you see what I mean, the American slave aspect. And that's the last time we really understand slavery because we see programs and read stories about it and we understand the emancipation of the slaves over 100 years ago and all of that aspect. So we have a, an idea of what it's like, you lose all your rights and do all this. That's not what happened here. This is a slave force, but it's not slaves in the same thing. These people had their own homes. These people lived in their own land. They still exercised their own separation. They still circumcised their children. They still observed what they understood about the worship of their God. They separated themselves. Their slave Masters were Hebrews. In other words, this was a workforce for all intent and purposes. And it had successfully built city after city after city. Other people were in the fields, other people were doing different things. But the king saw that no matter what he did to afflict them, no matter what he did to cause them problems, hurt, and difficulties, they continued to be blessed. They continued to multiply. They continued to be a people separated. So he decided he would have to take more drastic actions. So this king determined, this pharaoh said, let us kill the children. Let us kill the male children of this people and let the girls live. And he ordered he ordered the midwives to do it. But you know, for some reason, and you know, it's really strange when you read it, you have to ask yourself, how did the midwives manage to get away from this? How did they manage to not have to do it? You've got a command from a king. You would listen to the command from a king. So how did they do it? They came up with an excuse. But it wasn't, it wasn't a lie. It was something that was really happening. They were simply, shall we say, used it to their advantage. And what they were saying was, when we get there, the child's already born in a way. These women don't need us. And that was true. The Egyptian woman had real difficulties given birth. It was a prolonged, excruciating process. But the Hebrew women weren't having that bother. They were blessed. So, Pharaoh made another decision. This time he's talking directly to the people, 
the Hebrews themselves and he makes an order you will kill any male child born to yourself but during this time of course a Levi man falls in love with a Levi woman and she has a son the child is beautiful could not envisage this child being put to death. Yet the moment its existence becomes known, that's what will have to happen. It'll have to be put to death. Hundreds of children were being put to death at this period under the order of this child. Hundreds. This was the oppression of oppressions within their life. But God protected this child. He was brought up in Pharaoh's own palace. He was taught everything he needed to know. And he envisaged in many ways that God was going to use him in some way to release this burden from his people. When he was 40, with this in mind, he intervened on behalf of two Hebrews who were being abused. And in the struggle, he killed an Egyptian. This was something that you cannot do. He was still a Hebrew at the end of the day, and therefore his rights were, re were re with regard to touching the with regard to touching the Egyptians were somewhere like how it used to be many years ago with regard to the black versus the white scenario. If the black touched the white, they paid their life. That was the sort of law that was done at this time of this year. If the Hebrew touched the Egyptian, he would pay his life. And Moses was a Hebrew. So when he became aware of the fact that it was known that he had done this, and when he became aware that the king, this king who had caused all this bother, had now commanded that he be killed, he fled. We know the story. For another 40 years, he looks after sheep. He marries, settles down, and he grows to be an old man. That what you have in sir. In the meantime, Egypt has a new king. The old pharaoh is dead. A new pharaoh has taken the throne and this new pharaoh has decided to retain and even make worse the slavery of the Hebrews. The cry is going up to God in heaven from this enslaved people and they want to be freed of it. And so, as you would expect, God responds. He sees a shepherd in the wilderness, an old man, 80 years old, and he says to him, Look that way. And as Moses is looking around, not realizing what he's looking at or if he's looking at anything, because he didn't hear a voice, but the spirit had moved him. He suddenly realized, hey, there's a tree going over there. See the tree? Hang on. Why is that tree burning? Yet nothing's happening to it. it, it the leaves aren't curling up. The, so he decides to go forward. He wants to have a look at it. And immediately a voice speaks to him. A loud voice. Stop! Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And then he's introduced to the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. Moses had heard about these all his life. These were his ancestors. These were the people who had received the promise. These were the people with whom God had always dealt with. He had never, in his wildest dreams, imagined that he himself would be meeting this same God. It's funny. Yeah. God says to Abraham, or sorry, God says to Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and to tell the people that I have come. I have come down from heaven to 
free them from their burden and to bring them into the promised land that I give to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you go and tell them, and Moses has it, as you go. He points out, nice and simply, hang on now, go for it. Just a couple of things. One, they ain't going to believe it. I mean, come on, I'm an old man. I talked to a tree in the desert. They're really going to accept that, yeah. They're not going to believe me. I know these people. They have been 400 years in Egypt. They've had the good times and the bad times. They're aware of all the stories. But they're not going to accept one man coming to say, this is it, we're doing it now. Not going to happen. So God says, well, look, I'll tell you what. We'll give them some evidence. Where's your staff? Throw it down. And it turns into a snake. And he says, grab it by its tail. And he picks it up again and turns back into a snake. And he says, they'll probably need something more because the Egyptians know that. Put your hand in your bosom. Take it out. It was all covered in lepers. He says, put it back in. Take it out. It's all clean. He says, no one can do that. That's original. And if that don't work, if they still don't believe you then, go to the Nile, take a little of the water from the Nile, bring it up onto the land, and pour it out in front of them, and it will turn to the blood. In other words, God was saying, I am not going to work with this people and expect them to believe me by faith. I'm going to show them Everything I do before their eyes. I'm going to give them the evidence of everything I do so that they know. And I have to do that because they don't have a grain of faith to rub between them. They have nothing. So I know that. Because I know that, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this this way. We know the story. Moses goes. He introduces himself to the people. He does the miracle, miraculous signs that God has given him to do, and the people immediately believe, believe what he says. They say, Yes, great, God's going to do this, this is going to be marvelous, we're going to be out of here tomorrow. They're all over the moon about it. It's a great rejoice. Problem solved. God's on the case. They say they don't know God. They don't have an understanding or an inkling of how God works or what his purposes are. They don't understand or know him. Their expectation is here, now, no waiting, let's get it done. And that's the problem. Because the moment Moses and Aaron go and stand before Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, Yeah, what? Who's this Lord God? I don't know the Lord God. By the way, when it says that he called him the Lord God, he meant Yahweh, for God gave his name. He said, I didn't give my name to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, but I'm giving my name to you and to the people so they know who I am. And his name was Yahweh, which is translated as Lord. So he says, I don't know this Yahweh. I don't know this Lord. Who is he? Where did he come from? What's he doing? And he tricks him. So... Staff was down. <coughs> Pharaoh was down. Not bad, either. Rob, do you? Mm, I think better about that stuff. The Jason's going to say, yeah, not really, you know, not really bad looking. And they threw down their staffs and all turned the snakes. Not a problem. They can do it, and your God's not a lot perfect. They're in the end. They're in the end. No problem here. So, Han goes out. Han goes out. Ooh, that's a trickier one. We can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that. Though. But you see, this is how. The Pharaoh says, "Look, I've thought about it," and the answer is no. And then he says, "See these Hebrews? If they think they have time, if they have enough energy." To be able to want to go and do a three-day worship of their God out in the wilderness away from their work. We're not working in the land. So what I want you to do is to go out 
and stop giving them straw for making bricks. They have to go and gather it. But do you see the total bricks that they have to do? There are a lot of number that is required. They're quota. It's not to change. No. Next day, this goes into play, this goes into action, and the Hebrews are enraged about it. So what do they do? They get their union. They get involved, and the professional union man of the Hebrews comes and sees Pharaoh. These taskmasters of yours have gone nuts. They want us to do the exact same work, exact same amount of work we've done, but they're not giving us any straw to be able to make the cross, the mix. This just can't be done. This is ridiculous. We want the straw prepared for us. But Pharaoh wouldn't entertain them at all. In fact, he says, look, if you to have time to go out and worship your God for three days, then you have time to be able to get the straw as well. It's your God's spot. Pick it up with him. But these will use you in the face, shall we? Because that's a nice name we understand. Go back out. They're, they're ripping. And they make Aaron and Moses. And Aaron and Moses towards Pharaoh's palace again because God had instructed them to. And they stopped them and said, what are you doing to us? You've made our burden worse. You haven't got us out of Egypt. You haven't helped us. The God that you seem to be worshipping doesn't care about us. He's made matters worse for us. You see, their attitude is only what they see, how it affects them, why it affects them. This is the problem that these people have. It doesn't matter what God's going to do for them. Even though he takes them out of Egypt, even though he crosses the Red Sea, even though they do all these things together, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they want more. They want him to do it now, without anything required from them. God has a problem. He's enraged with them. Sometimes we sit, the Bible says he was grieved by them. Other modern translations put it another way. He was disgusted by them. Disgusted. These people so infuriated God that on numerous occasions he tried to wipe them out. He put play against them. He suggested to Moses stand by. This is it. I'm just going to let them out. I can work all I need to do through you individually. I don't need them. <laughs> Most of them. I like them. Do that you think you're only them? I mean, you think how enraged God must have got when he allowed that aspect of his personality to be recorded. These people really got under God's, we'll use this simply, skin. They really got it. They tested him to distraction. So what do we learn? Well, remember that in Revelations? Remember we mentioned that there's something happening in the church in Revelations that we need to understand? I stopped reading in verse 16 of Revelations 3 that I will vomit you out of my life. Because that's where I want to bring up that other story. So that you understood why God rejected Israel and made the next generation inherit, rather than that generation. Because here's what's happening to the end time church. Verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy. And have need of nothing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is also described that generation that was taken out of Egypt. They still lived in their little dream world that they remembered before the persecution started when they were eating watermelons and the best of cucumbers and had the wonderfulest feasts and had such a wonderful time together. 
when everything was going perfectly for them. That's all they could remember. They forgot. They forgot the problems when they were in the desert. They forgot that. And that's what the church is doing now. The church continually has a problem. She doesn't realize that she has a problem. And it's a major problem. They're wretched. Do you know what wretched means? Seriously. I was thinking about this. Wretched is a description that we use a lot in our world. I am really wretched today. I just, ah, the whole thing's going wrong. I feel terrible. I'm in the worst form ever. And that's a perfect example of wretchedness. You just feel every ache and pain in your body and you're just down. Ill. Burdened. Problem. They're miserable. Do you know what miserable means? <sighs> the things you really are. Ah, oh, depressed. Fell. What's the point of going on? I get nowhere out of the way. I can't really achieve anything. It's so hard to wish it was all over. Oh, will he ever shut up? Oh, no. Wretched and miserable. And the church is like that. They're wretched and they're miserable. They're sick and they complain because they're suffering. Do you know that this era of the church is one of the few eras where official depression is recognized? Before, the church never had depression because what was their hallmark was that they were a happy, loving, caring people who laid their concerns and worries before God and didn't worry about them. It was unique. They were filled with, what was that word? Oh yes, joy. Do you know what we don't have in the church? No. Joy. Because you're depressed. You're annoyed. You're wretched. You're miserable. It's so terrible. But that's how it is. This is why this end generation church has to be noted. We recognize where it is. What else do they have? They're poor. They're blind. And they're naked. Well, they're poor. We're all poor. I know that. But we're poor for a different reason. We're poor spiritually. Is we have no riches in heaven. We have nothing saved up because we have no faith. We lack confidence in God. We're not doing the work as he intends us to do it. We're not representing him to the fullness of that he wants us to do. Blind? Well, Jesus put it perfectly. You teach the doctrines of men over the doctrines of God. And that's exactly what this church do time and time again. Every time I get into a Christian debate with people in Christianity, I find they immediately say, but this theologian said, and this theologian said, and this church father said, and I'm going, okay, but I don't need this what God said. The rest of them are all liars. Forget about them. They're not important. I only want to know what God said. And that's the problem. People will take the message that comes from their elders, their, you know, the fathers, so to speak, the church fathers, rather than the message that comes directly from the Bible by the Spirit of God, which is a lie from living in us. So God's rejected totally. So they're blind. They don't understand. And the last thing it says here is that they're naked. Totally naked. Now how can a person go out and not realize that they're on God? But spiritually that's what's happening to the Christian church today. Because they don't understand that they're meant to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And to be clothed in Christ you have to have a relationship with him. You can't have somebody put their clothes around you unless you're close enough to them for them to do that. But this Christian church of today, what it does is different. What it does is it says, no, no, no. We don't think the God who is so loving and kind would ever judge us for doing something that we don't really understand. And therefore, they're sexually immoral. They have weird ideas, to say the least. They question the virgin birth. 
They're nearly 100% convinced that they don't believe in the resurrection. And apart from that, apart from that, they teach, well, actually, you're not going to be resurrected, but you are going to go to heaven. They teach the doctrines of men. So their righteousness, which they think they have, is in reality total nudity. And as you go through the Bible, you realize when you measure Christ against many of the Christians that we meet in the world today, you're meeting streakers for all intents and purposes. But that's the warning. We're told that in Egypt, that first church, that first church that was in the wilderness, rejected God because they couldn't and wouldn't understand his ways. They wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't accept that he was God, he was in charge, and he knew what he was doing. And we are now at the end in exactly the same boat. We are dealing with a church worldwide, completely on every planet of the earth, that has nearly 36 thousand different denominations that don't agree and that increases that's an internet one from about a year ago so it might higher than that now 36,000 that don't agree yet they're all under the banner of Christianity and they all claim that Christ is not that so in one sense they're true but in another sense they haven't got true and that's the problem so what's the message God gives us? One line. One line. These people do err in their heart.